Welcome, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck, joined today by film guy Matthew or Matthew Film Guy. Uh, I never know which way you like to stylize it. <laughs> it was whichever way Sam originally anointed me, so I think it was Matthew Film Guy, but, you know, hey, I'm not yeah. one to argue. I just I accept the mantle graciously. Uh, award-winning uh, film editor uh, at Langdon Boom on Twitter. Uh, Matt, uh, you have recently enriched my life uh, and sort of my ability to do Left Reckoning by providing me documentaries, uh, a trilogy that the first uh, installment I had heard of before, and I think I'd even seen a crappy version online. Mm. Um, and it, it very good. It goes along with, um, we're talking about, I, I should just back up. We're talking about the uh, Prairie Trilogy by a filmmakers, uh, Rob Nilsson and John Hansen. Uh, this is a series of films about the uh, Socialist Nonpartisan League in North Dakota, basically um, from around 1914-ish to uh, 1920s, which sort of led into the um, uh, populist victories later in uh, North Dakota. But the, the these documentaries, you know, I, let me back up. Matt, how did you come across these? Because uh, I know why I, like, these These have come up. There's a couple books just to give people a little bit of reading if they want um, more but Political Prairie Fire was this one by uh, Robert Moreland, which is 1955. It's sort of the, um, I think, one that probably influenced this narrative uh, a little bit. Like, there's a lot of the beats uh, are, the, are similar um, in Prairie Fire documentary that was released in 1977 that we're talking about here. And then also more recently, Insurgent Democracy by Michael Lansing, 2016, uh, about the Nonpartisan League. But, uh, Matt, how did you come across these documentaries? Well, you know, as it says in the name, Film Guy, I came at these from the filmmaker side of things. Rob Nelson was a filmmaker who actually, ironically enough, the same film professor from Boston University, you probably heard me and Sam talk about, who introduced us together, uh, this guy Ray Carney, was a big booster of his independent films, narrative films, um, from the 80s. Uh, he made a couple films. In fact, his first feature film, which was also with John Hansen, was called Northern Lights, and that, I believe won an award at the Cannes Film Festival, and it was like a really early 1978, I think, uh, independent film to sort of make a splash on the world scene. Sadly, kind of forgotten these days, but I suggest anybody interested in these documentaries go back and watch that one because it features uh, the same guy as a kind of a framing device, and so this was connected. But I had seen that film in film school on VHS or whatever and sought out the couple, you know, semi-available independent films that he's made over the years, this guy, Rob Nelson. And um, then at some point the internet was invented and I realized, wow, I had access to more of his films than I ever could, even when, you know, dubbing VHS is at Kim's video or something and uh, found out about these documentaries, uh, maybe just from looking at his IMDb or Wikipedia or something like that. And, uh, sought them out and only recently saw them myself and was extremely impressed. And uh, so, yeah, in my completest mind, I just want to see everything this guy did. And uh, then I noticed, hmm, North Carolina, I mean, North Carolina, North Dakota, <laughs> uh, who do I know that might be interested in this uh, material? And uh, thus I reached out to you and thought I would share the wealth. Well, that's what's funny about that is, uh, as you say, like you you saw Prairie or uh, what was the the one Northern um, Lights Northern Lights in film school, and you know I had heard of that that film carried some significance, but as a North Dakotan, I think we have, or at least I have, an inferiority complex where when I hear something has an association to North Dakota, I assume that its importance is being inflated. And, and like, right, like, so I didn't see Fargo until I saw that, oh, people outside of North Dakota are really into that movie, too. And so I, I, I it's actually gratifying to hear because, I, you know, I don't know if it's just trivia. Look, it's like Lawrence Welk is also from North Dakota. It's like no one's fucking with Lawrence Welk anymore. Um, but, yeah, what was this like? Talk about like being introduced to uh, Northern Lights. Like, what's that? Why is that remembered and so significant? Well, again, in the 80s or in this late 70s, you know, the American independent film scene was not nearly what it became in the 80s. There was sort of like, you know, if you look into the, the history of independent film, people think it started with John Cassavetes in New York when they made cameras small enough for normal people to sort of carry them around the streets. But, you know, it goes back a little bit before then. But he's one of the major tentpoles. And then the second sort of big wave was in the 80s, guys like Jim Jarmusch 
and uh, things coming out of New York, Spike Lee, making She's Gotta Have It and so on. And But in between, there was just a few sort of notable names. Um, maybe you could say uh, Victor Nunez or some of these obscure people, maybe unless you're a real film guy, you, you wouldn't have even come across. But Northern Lights by Rob Nelson. And Rob Nelson went on to sort of be almost like a, an institution in San Francisco. That's really, I think, where his base uh, was mm -hmm. for the most part. I don't know if that means he was a, a tourist in uh, North Dakota or, or what his connection is. I'm not sure on the biography side of things. But he was one of these guys that was carrying on the sort of independent legacy, not chasing big studio kind of success with a calling card film, really just sort of doing workshops and developing films with no to low budgets that met with some, you know, I say success in quotes, but, um, you know, really, I'm a huge fan of his films, um, uh, Signal 7, and a new one I just recently saw, Heat and Sunlight. These are dramatically narrative films, much more personal, about sort of, you know, daily lives and human subjectivity and these kinds of dramas. There is a political sort of edge to them. They're always set in a kind of working class milieu or up against, uh, like, Heat and Sunlight is about a photographer who goes to Biafra. So he was always a kind of... Um, outsider filmmaker and you know my proclivities are drew through me to seek out his stuff um you know he's one of a, a few key names like that and he was a guy that this guy ray carney had said like oh he's one of the ones doing it for real if you can see it go for it and again it took a sort of the advent of uh underground film being more widely available eventually a couple of those the two i mentioned came out on dvd but um yeah just being yeah. uh a hard-nosed independent film lover led me to Rob Nelson. And and also, as I uh, set you up for, in my online film appreciation class where I try to show movies that are, let's say, off the beaten path, require a little bit more of your third eye, your, 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 not your sort of left brain, deeper, kind of more esoteric movies in a way, um, I hand out an article that I read of his that he wrote in two, 2007, yeah, uh, that... It, it makes a very interesting distinction between movies that are about things or that movies actually are things like experiences versus subject. And that's a, a kind of a philosophical concept in understanding film that I'm extremely fascinated by. So he's a guy who's been helping me out in my class for, I don't know, at least a decade now. Yeah. You know, I, just to take the uh, opening of this today, almost everyone makes uh, subject films, a film about the health system a film about a man from Spokane, blah, blah, blah. Hollywood, for example, its films are about subjects, things apart from the experiences uh, of their makers, except a film like All That Jazz, which is a terrific film, partly because it's all about show business, something, which is funny because you do see a lot of movies that are like about Hollywood or like, like the player. He even mentions the player. I, and I saw another one. It's like uh, the, the reason these movies are good I think like is because it is, like he says, from their experience, not because it's like Hollywood, such a great thing. Um, right. Uh, right. What you know, uh, these people are doing. Exactly. Um, and uh, uh, but he, then he goes on to like talk about um, you can trust a combination of deep artistry and personal connection. This is why I think that uh, Elam Klimov's Come and See is a far greater film uh, than uh, David Lean's somewhat empty epic Lawrence of Arabia. You can feel Klimov's uh, identifications with World War Two Russian partisans fighting the Nazis. He was a, he was Russian. He lived through it. Lawrence of Arabia is a fairy tale done by somebody who didn't have first-hand experience with the subject. You know um, that movie, Come and See, by the way? I don't know. I was going to look that up. That is, I, I believe it's Letterboxd is now number one rated movie uh, or something like that. It's, you know, not that oh, wow. necessarily the, the best metric to go on, uh, but it's somewhat better than going like on IMDb's. But regardless, it has a reputation of being like the most disturbing war film because it is, you know, you are there. It's called Come and See, like, look. Uh, and it's oh, yeah. harrowing and extremely um, destabilizing, which to me, that's the best art is to shake you up on some level. And it really is what how he describes it. And don't get me wrong, I love Lawrence of Arabia for the Hollywood epic that it is, but it's it's uh, apples and oranges. I, I mean, I feel like that, like, to represent something like that, I just feel more comfortable as an artist um with the what Nielsen prefers artistically, because I I don't know how you feel the confidence to convey a uh, just a pure fairy tale like that. Like I'm impressed by 
like sort of artists who do that, but I don't understand it. Yeah, I, man, I'm I'm right there with you. And and I went to film school with people whose entire dedication and had followed their careers was to creating these massive fairy tales. And I have nothing but respect for the ability to make that in, in terms of craft and, and artistry. But it's absolutely not what sort of lights my fire. And it's it's not quite as uh, I mean, it's easy to say, but it's not as commercial to make these kinds of movies because they're not as frivolous they're not as entertaining sometimes although sometimes they are and they're yeah. more destabilizing their art they're they're there to upset the apple cart not just smooth you back to bed you know which yeah. sometimes i like to be smooth back to bed but you know when you're asking I mean, the real deal look to me i don't know how it's not you know a world you know blockbuster hit to watch an old socialist wander on my north dakota trying to remember where buildings are i want to live <laughs> in your world matt Bring me there. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but, I, you know, on to Prairie Fire, which is I'm going to put at, um, after this talk here. Um, it opens with such economical filmmaking. It's not something that I'm really like, uh, I think, the most keyed into. But even I can notice, OK, the very first seconds we have train tracks, which North Dakota would not be what it is without the trains. And uh, Farmers wouldn't have been there if the trains didn't need somebody to uh, fleece um, by moving their product, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the train track, you hear Native American-inspired sort of flutes, uh, So you, and then you have the word Uncle Sam, which it goes, like, that cuts through so much ideology in North Dakota, especially, like, generations that are farther removed from the homesteading experience uh, mm -hmm. that think, like, the, it, it, that have forgotten Actually, you wouldn't have had that rebirth through the ground of like uh, the sort of homestead. Um, uh, I forget what they call it, the sod house experience, which my family went through. Mm -hmm. If the really? government hadn't hadn't removed the Sioux, uh, the Lakota from the land. Right. And and I think like immediately there doesn't probably dwell on that, um, obviously, because this is a political uh, um, uh, thing. But there's sensitivity toward that reality. That I think is important to point out when, you know, especially like growing up when I did, people just don't have that understanding of like, it's just, oh, we got to come here because nobody else wanted to be here. And we're the ones who put up with the winters. And that's not quite the case. But and then nonetheless, you get to like the the, uh, you know, that just those opening scenes are so well done, I thought. Or, or there's so much in all of these and like tr different transitions. You have like music playing and then all of a sudden a very hard cut. And actually, things didn't work out quite as well as they wanted. A lot of like subtle things for like, I'll be honest, when I see a movie from like 50 years ago, almost 40, I, I imagine like, and I know this is wrong given like what I've seen from film classes, but like, I expect less artistry. Yeah, you're not alone in that sorely misunderstood prejudice, but I understand where it comes from. I listen, even... I, even when I was in school in the '90s, there were kids who were like, "I don't want to watch anything that's in black and white." Like, yeah. okay, you're, you're, but yes, there is a um, sort of a prejudice towards the now, a recentism, if you want to call it that. And uh, yeah, seeing this movie is definitely um, a reminder that there were guys making extremely important and uh, you know creative use of the medium, even in. And I'll just, I want to just set up this because Prairie Fire is the first of three. And I much prefer the other two, and I think I heard you say something similarly, so if people yes. can seek out the other two, because because if just coming from my point of view, which may not be exactly what your audience is looking for, but maybe, uh, you know, Prairie Fire is much more a history. It's, mu it's a well-done history, but it is much more outwardly focused. It's much more about summing up the sort of milieu of the time and the various political and power dynamics that were happening. And it's it's framed with this guy, Henry Martinson, who's this 90 at the time of the making of the movie, 94 year old man remembering how he was there and so on. Um, but then the next two, they they take a turn to what I'm much more inspired by, which is to make it sort of much more about him and make it these sort of personal reflections of not just where he was, but how he's living now and what the results of the past have led to how he's living now and his attitude despite uh, some setbacks, let's say, without taking too much away from the seeing of the movie, his just uh, disposition and some of the same conversations he's having in 1978 that he was having in 1920 and 1917, um, when it started to become more um, what I like to call ambient in its storytelling, right? Just shots of him in his house, shots of him behaving, moving. Uh, it to Department me, it went up stores. To 
the oh well, yeah of course just d doing his daily chores sitting at the bar um all that kind of stuff to me is uh you know because my proclivity is my is to go towards the art the the, the kind of you know there's kinds of knowledge right and it, one mm -hmm. is not necessarily better than the other they're just sort of different there's political historical knowledge and then there's the sort of I don't know what you want to call it more. I didn't, you probably don't like the word spiritual, but the sort of more humanistic, uh, you know, sort of consciousness, subjectivity kind of knowledge that you get from from a work of art per se. And I'll be totally honest. I'm normally sort of skeptical about thinking I'm learning history from a film because it's I, as you said, maybe before we get on, it's you don't know how much is fudged, how much is shaved, how much time can they not spend in a half an hour, 45 minute documentary of things that in a real scholarly work would be included, but they take it out for expedience. So I'm always yeah. grateful when I'm inspired to learn more from a movie like this about the times, but I'm also usually rather skeptical that I've learned anything um, on in terms of facts and, and history and knowledge like that. Um, so I, tr I tend to trust more the kinds of uh, artistically made films that and these wind up doing really a lot of both, uh, you know, Prairie Fire is much more uh, fact based or sort of content. Uh, and the other two will get sort of as it goes on in the trilogy, sort of this ratio changes. But yeah. uh, did you, by the way, see Rebel Earth, the second one? You saw all three, right? I saw all three. Yep. Another little tidbit I just want to throw in because I know we're not going to be here too long is uh, Rebel Earth is actually a reference to uh, you said you, you don't think of movies being artistic before a certain time, but an even earlier movie by uh, this uh, Ukrainian filmmaker Dovzhenko. He made a movie called Earth in 1930 that was all about um, the the it was this was pre Ukrainian um, uh, you know starvation uh, you know I forget what the name of it is when when they basically the sort of the modernization led to this sort of forced uh, famine. Uh, in, in Ukraine at the time, and it's all about the uh, the Communist Party bringing in this new machine, this new threshing machine, and everybody's reactions to it, whether they were for it or against it, trying to convince all the people that this is the way of the future and so on. But anyway, it's it's a direct reference at the beginning of this movie because that film famously opens up with a shot of wheat fields and the wind blowing through it. And that's the first shot of uh, Rebel Earth as well. So he's making a connection to not just uh, films of the past, but sort of the similar struggles of uh, you know power structures and its impact on farming the land. And if you want to, and that movie is really trippy. If you really want to see a uh, artistically risky movie from way before any of us were born, uh, I'd check out Dojvenko's Earth. It's a good oh, interesting. piece. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, you know, and you you mentioned uh, Martinson, uh, Henry Martinson, who is the um, the poet sort of organizer who is featured in his later years in the in the second two, which will play in the uh, uh, post game on Tuesday night for folks. Um, he is a perfect. He's he's the he's the guy you choose uh, for a romantic view of this era, uh, as opposed to AC Townley, who is another organizer who. You know, he has an interesting moment where uh, he's driving the Model T from farm to farm, but he later turned towards anti-communism and Red Scare sort of stuff in like the 30s and 40s. So that's this guy, you know, who was like a labor uh, commissioner into his 90s and, you know, kept the good fight. You know, he's he's a much, you know, he's he, much close to our hearts uh, where he wound up. But so like, you know, and that sort of and uh, the sort of fall of. That you get a little taste of that of how, how things didn't go exactly how uh, they, the socialists in the um, uh, nonpartisan league wanted it to. Um, yeah, yeah, they're not. There's no romanticizing of the uh, effects that it had. It's very straight faced. Yeah, and you know, spoiler alert: World War One, uh, <laughs> um, not gr and and the Red uh, uh, Scare, um, uh, the nineteen uh, 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 teens version. But um, you know, I, the other thing I want to say, like, just. As, What's wild to me about these films is like, especially the first one, it reminds me of like what we used to do on TMBS, the illicit histories, right? <laughs> like it's sort of like that sort of it's, it's condensed into a, a sort of propaganda form. Um, and, and I think that's great, but it's wild to me like now looking at that and I think people are going to love it and really understand if that came out today, uh, it, it would, it feels like it's for like it, the modern distribution methods, right? Like YouTube and streaming. And 
to me it's it's so impressive that people were doing this and it was way like that's just the making it is just the start getting people to actually see it was way harder well, and also, if you look in the credits, I can't remember if it was exactly Prairie Fire, but I had just I just rewatched Northern Lights uh, to kind of bone up for this. And you see that it is supported by a whole slew of arts councils, both yeah. national and local. So there was a push to make ed educational films uh, for the population. I, maybe it would have played at your library or maybe it would have played on PBS, local stations like that. Um, but you're right. It Obviously, it couldn't have had the reach that it would have today. But yeah, the idea of the agitprop film was not invented with uh, YouTube by any means. Uh, and yeah. this is a really good example of, uh, you know, the state of the art in the 1970s. Well, uh, Matthew, uh, Letterboxd, people, you can drive people towards there. Where else should you, uh, where else should people follow uh, Matthew Film Guy? My content? new show on Rumble starts. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> come, yeah, come talk movies with me at... Um, Letterbox. I'm also on the Majority Report Discord in the uh, film room there occasionally. I like to talk to people about stuff there. And uh, you can also, if you're really interested in seeing some mind-blowing films from across time, across the world, you can come join my online film appreciation class. You can see the link at my Twitter at Langdon Boom. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm around. So let's talk movies. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks for having me, Matt. The Small Farmers the League organized to protect are about gone now. A way of life which I knew out on the prairie has almost passed away. At that time, my Uncle Sam promised everybody that uh, had the grit and the gumption and the ambition to go out and homestead 160 acres of land in what they call the homestead country. As soon as I acquired my age, 21 years, I went to my father and I told him, now you've been a homesteader yourself, you homesteaded the farm that uh, I have helped you uh, work on here near Sacred Heart, and I want to go and get some land of my own. Okay, he says. He says, here's $65. He says, that should that's more than I had when I homesteaded in Minnesota, and it should uh, carry you through. My homestead was uh, about 18 miles southwest of a small town in northwestern North Dakota named uh, Crosby. Now homesteading is really a rewarding experience and I think every American and even Norwegian should uh, try it once. Everything is new, the soil is new, even the heavens seem 
new, especially when you see an exhibition of northern lights some night that you can only see up in northwestern North Dakota, uh, I believe. But uh, you've got to have some place to live, regardless of a uh, poetic feeling that you may have in regard to the wonder of the country. Therefore, I loaded on some two by fours and some thin lumber in Williston, and I got out there, just unloaded the lumber and walked it around it a few times and looked here and there, and pretty soon somebody coming over the hill, and then another neighbor coming over the hill, all ready to help me build that shack. Didn't take long with so many neighbors to build a shack, a 10 by 12 shack, and sod all around it, just thin boards to keep the sod from falling into the house. Couldn't go any place. And uh, because it was too far to go any place, there was no place to go even if we wanted to. We had good neighbors. Believe it or not, we danced in 10 by 12 shacks. And actually, we lived like kings in that homestead shack for winter and summer. source of income that the homesteader had after he began really farming was of course to take the grain that he raised on his homestead land and bring it to town to the elevator. And uh, there's where they got their first jolt. The elevator man would look at it, now nah, it don't look so good. I guess we'll have to grade that number three or maybe even uh, Number four rejected, and that meant cutting down the price considerably. And there's a lot of uh, foreign seeds in that grain, the elevator man would say to them. I guess we'll have to dock you about 10 pounds on the bushel. All that cut in still more. And I'm sorry to say that the price has uh, gone down a little bit uh, lately, and that cut in a little more. And by the time he'd sold his grain, the farmer found out that he just about had uh, enough uh, money maybe to get a couple of pounds of coffee and uh, some sugar and so forth and so on and back he went but the next year he would start all over again of course the elevator man wasn't entirely the uh, culprit because he'd ship it and the railroad would charge exorbitant rates and even though he'd send number one down to uh, minneapolis why they would uh, uh, declare it to be number four when they got down there and cheat him on that so it was just a god darn game, uh, highway robbery game from start to finish. From the elevator man clear down to the grain markets in Minneapolis. And uh, that wasn't uh, the worst of it either. And when you come to borrowing money or having to do with banks or uh, agents for the big moneyed interests in the East, of course, that had become very obvious that uh, you were uh, pretty much of a uh, sucker for them. Everything was, seemed to be rigged against the farmer.
Now, in those days, they had what you might call hotel politics. The political bosses traveled by train between the Merchants Hotel in St. Paul to the McKinsey in Bismarck, making deals which controlled the business and politics of the state. Alec McKinsey, he was a lobbyist for the railroads and later for all the Twin City business interests. He'd been boss of North Dakota for as long as people could remember. Alex McKinsey and old Jim Hill, elbow deep in the public till, stayed in Mitzi Railroad side hotel. Pouring boot like gin for the other big wheels, squealing and dealing down the low down deal, money on the mines and flowers in their lapel. Oh, the hotel party. The Had the people in a terrible fix Thought the farmers were a bunch of hicks With their ring the bell, go to hell, hotel politics McKinsey's connection spread east back along the railroad hotel circuit to the financial centers of the country where men like Rockefeller, Morgan, and Gold, the robber barons were getting rich at the expense of the farmers and working people. But we weren't taking it lying down. Labor was organizing around the country. There was the IWW and the Western Federation of Miners, Strikes in Lawrence, Coeur d'Alene, Telluride, Cripple Creek, the massacre of Ludlow. Farmers had their organizations too, strong ones like the Farmers Alliance and the American Society of Equity. Political parties such as the Populist Party and the Socialist Party of America had been formed but none of them had given the farmers what they needed, political power. In February 1915, A.C. Townley, Fred Wood, and his son Howard got together at the Wood House up near Deering to lay some plans. In the dead of winter, Townley and the Woods hitched up and went out to organize. Now Townley had been a farmer. He went broke in flax, bottom fell out of the market, and most of the organizers were farmers too. They would go into a district and sign up an influential farmer who would then go along as a booster to introduce the organizer. They spoke to the farmers as neighbors, as men who had the same interests and goals, and the farmers responded. to take over the Republican Party, the only party with any strength in those days, by using a direct primary in the spring of 1916. The most important specific things in their platform were a state-owned and operated bank, so farmers could get cheap, long-term loans, and a state-owned mill and elevator to stop the abuses of the Minneapolis grain trade. But the real issue, which lay behind everything, was farmers' control over the economic conditions of their lives. Left to its own devices, government had done nothing for them. So it was time to take over the government. While Townley and the farmers were out in the snow organizing, Alex McKinsey and his cronies sat in their luxurious hotel suites enjoying their bootleg booze. They heard about the league, but they didn't take it seriously. They knew that J.P. Morgan Company alone had control of over a hundred corporations worth more than twenty billion dollars. What could a few farmers do allied against power like that? 
As spring came on, they got some more organizers, many from the Socialist Party, to which town they used to belong, and they got old man Wood to stand them to a couple of Model T's to get around in, and they went to town. When people asked, tried us call the nonpartisan league, Howard said, if you had to choose between being kicked by a donkey or trampled by an elephant, which would you take? So they were nonpartisan, and that's how it went. into 1916, organizing reached fever pitch. Suddenly the big newspapers got wind of what was uh, happening. The league was infiltrated with socialists, free lovers, reds and homebreakers of every stripe. One, two, one, two, three, four. Big Biz was finally frightened. <laughs> This is to be a peaceful revolution by means of the ballot. The explosives that are to burst forth to light, the progress of man to a better, broader life are accumulated. The fuel is there. The spark has been applied. The fire alarm has been set in, but the conflagration cannot be stopped. A farmer from Hoople, Lynn Fraser, with almost no political experience, was nominated for governor and among other state officials nominated was an ambitious young state's attorney from Wharton County, William Langer, League nominee for Attorney General. League President A.C. Townley preferred to be the power behind the throne, and anyway, the League had it ruled that no party officials could run for elective office. Former equity attorney William Lemke also began to emerge as the legal brains of the outfit. Now campaigning for the June primary began. The League, just as it always had, went directly to the people. He said there are no very rich men in North Dakota. He's right about that. They take your money and get out. Now how foolish it would be for a Rockefeller, a Hill, or a Morgan to hang around North Dakota, especially in the wintertime. What would they do to amuse themselves? We don't even play golf here. Not even an occasional $10,000 portal dog dinner. But let's get down to the real reason we're here tonight. In the last year, we've formed the strongest organization of farmers this nation has ever seen. And I'd like to introduce you to the man that we've chosen to represent us. The next governor of this state, a farmer, a leaguer, and our friend, Lynn J. Frazier. The tragedy of these movements is the fact that they sweep by so many so-called progressive and liberal-minded people, leaving them high and dry on deserts of doubt. This is no time to be on the fence. You cannot wait. The armies of progress are being organized. Their way is lighted by enthusiasm and loyalty to a cause. The bands are playing, the slogans of the people marching on to new and better things fill the air. This inspired army is passing your door. It is marching on to victory as certain as the rising of the sun tomorrow. The night before the primary election in 1916, there was a terrible rainstorm. If farmers were to get to the poles, they would have to go miles out of their way. Some men actually swam rivers in order to vote. But would it be enough?
But then the rural vote came in. Winning was one thing, but governing entirely another. The League set out in the 1917 legislative session to pass House Bill 44, which would provide for a new state constitution containing the League platform. League legislators met each night during the session at the Northwest Hotel, where Czar Townley and Bishop Bill Lemke, as they were called by opponents, were strong influences in deciding League policy. Unit rule prevailed. Leaguers hacked out their differences in all night sessions, but in the morning they presented a united front in legislative chambers. The special interests are not saying much just now, but this is only the lull before the storm. In a few days, the most vindictive, dishonest flood of criticism in the history of the United States will be let loose. We will be abused as few men have ever been abused because we have the courage to stand for a new order. But if you can really succeed in carrying out the League program, you will have done more toward the common good than any group of men in the world before you. Encouraged by its success, the League began organizing in 13 different states and established its national headquarters in St. Paul in 1917. The greatest success was met in Minnesota, where league back Charles Lindbergh Sr. was narrowly defeated in the Republican primary of 1918. The league had only limited success in other states, but it was remarkable that they could exist at all, considering the forces lined up against them. In other words, no matter what he says or does, a league worker is a traitor. What we need is a military court. You can't fool the military court, but you can't depend on juries. These men who are fighting our soldiers and stabbing them in the back are going to die. When you work 16 hours a day for liberty and democracy, you haven't much time or will to wave the flag. The profiteers and their kept press are very lavish of patriotism, but too much of it comes from the money they've stolen from us. In the 1918 elections, Lynn Fraser was re-elected and both houses of the legislature had clear League majorities. At last, the League's program of state ownership was pushed through. The state bank was established, funds allocated and ground broken for the new mill and elevator. A home builders association was formed to build low-cost homes and state workmen's compensation passed. The Industrial Commission, consisting of the Governor, the Attorney General, and the Commissioner of Agriculture and Labor was formed to guide North Dakota in its new business ventures. 
It seemed that North Dakota had become the laboratory for the most advanced social experiments in the country. But it was not to be. It is dominated wholly by Mr. A.C. Townley and a group of radical international socialists who have nothing in common with and no real sympathy for the farmer. If the league stays in power past the next election, most of the businessmen will leave the state and let the damned anarchists run it to suit themselves. But it won't last that long. The unkindest cut was the defection of Attorney General Bill Langer, along with State Auditor Carl Krasitsky and Secretary of State Tom Hall. Interesting experiment! But when I'm elected governor of North Dakota, the day after I'm inaugurated, there will not be a socialist left in the employ of the state. And I will wire the president personally. North Dakota is back in the United States. Kosicki and Langer were instrumental in helping the opposition, IBA, start the Red Flame, which featured the worst in yellow journalism and smear tactics. The Red Flame is socialism! Blind, unreasoning, radical socialism that has stolen into North Dakota under the guise of a farmer's movement. Political power and millions of dollars are being misused and squandered by a small coterie of red tag fanatics who are not farmers, not workers, not property owners, not taxpayers, in a number of instances, not even American citizens. <laughs> I leave office with the abiding conviction that the people of North Dakota will be in the front trenches of the forces that are now struggling to establish economic freedom for the producing classes of the world.